make for many, many reasons on many levels. Today's Shushan Purim is a very holy day. You know, Ibsodic Akoyan writes about how we wear Shdraimel and Shushan Purim. It's a little hard to go with Shdraimel in the car. Shushan Purim is an awesome day. I read something very nice about Shushan Purim this morning. Uh, <coughs> was that Shushan Purim, for us, you know, we don't live in a place that observes Shushan Purim as our main Purim, like they do in Yushalayim and Shushan. Mustama Shushan is Hamadan. I have friends who were born there in Hamadan, that's where Esther, there's a cover of Mordechai and Esther, traditionally located there in Hamadan in, in Iran. Um, maybe there's a few other places that, that uh, have the din of, of Shushan Purim. But for us, you know, there's the Samarov says the Shushan Purim. Is, um, is the main Purim because it's the Purim of Yushalayim. I don't think I'm going to get to the difficult part in this video. I'll make a separate video for that. Um, but it fills a void, you know, when, when we leave Kedusha of Shabbos. A lot of people have Nesiyonis, Motzei Shabbos, all of a sudden, because they're leaving Kedusha of Shabbos, they have a lot of tests, temptations when, when the Sabbath ends. So what do we have? We have Malava Malka, and we keep the dry Milan, we keep the Shabbos clothes on until after Malava Malka, and ideally really until bedtime if possible. And uh, this gives us chizik and brings the Kedusha of Shabbos into the whole week. Into the, because it's already, oh Shabbos, it's not Shabbos anymore, it's a weekday already, but the holiness of the Sabbath goes into the whole week with the Koyach of Shushan, of, of of the Malava Malka, of the meal that we eat after the Sabbath ends, and we're still wearing the Sabbath clothes, and we sing hymns, and we tell stories, and give us chizik. Shushan Purim is a whole day that's like an Indian in Malava Malka. And it's incredibly, you know, the Satmarav Tzchusikinleinu was a man who understood human psychology in a way that none of, you, you name any of the great psychologists who studied psychology, didn't understand the way that uh, many of our tzaddikim understood the insights. That, I'm not saying that <coughs> that our tzaddikim were greater psychologists necessarily in the fields of psychology, what, uh, scientifically. What I'm saying is that the insights that our tzaddikim had were insights that many of the great psychologists didn't have. That's that's the point what I'm saying here. Meaning and that's why let's for example Carl Jung, who is not Jewish, studied Jewish mysticism because he understood the psychological value of the Kabbalah. You know, a lot of people misunderstand Kabbalah, take it into ways that it shouldn't be taken. And in a way the fact that a psychologist like Jung studied Kabbalah shows that he understood that Kabbalah, in a way, is a psychological system. But that's all, also neither here nor there, but Satmarov understood the psychology of people very well. There was a, if, for example, people asked him, Alpi Halacha, how can you let people daven so late Shabbos morning? Satmarov himself, he had stomach issues, so he, he had he had to daven late. But so that's him, and that's according to the halacha. But that's according that's him personally. That has nothing to do with the hundreds of people, maybe even thousands of people at, at certain times of the year who were joining in in his minion. So on the weekdays, he said, you know, you have to daven before you go to work, whatever. If you can, you know, each person, you know, he, and he gave the right aids and things. But Shabbos, he said uh, that uh, he wanted people to do is get up early, learn, and then daven. And 
uh, people from other communities, non-Hasidic communities, they're concerned with the question of Zman Tefillah, which is a valid question, a halachic issue. The Rebbe said, well, and then those people suggested, you want the Hasidim to learn, you know, they assumed he's a Rebbe, like all the Rebbes, that, you know, he wanted Hasidim, that wasn't really his goal. You want the Hasidim to learn, then uh, have them learn after davening. Which in other Hasidic lives, you see such a thing, you know, like, I think uh, the Ger Rebbe, he would tell the Hasidim, learn for 37 minutes at least, something like that, because he said if he said a half hour, the half hour could become 25 minutes, but if he says 37, he knows you're going to keep 37 because it's a precise number, things like that. That's more for Hasidim. The Satmarov wasn't looking for Hasidim. He was just looking to make people normal Jews. He, you know, and if, and if he could make a few Talmidei Chachamim, all the better. And Baruch Hashem, he made tremendous Talmidei Chachamim because of his Derech limit. you know, his Talmidim have qualities that you don't see in other places because of this... Um, because of his approach, which is just a classical Hungarian approach, and it's not necessarily emphasis on Hasidus, and that really produced tremendous payers, you know. His humility was, combined with his uh, sense of humor, was tremendous. You know, he, he was sitting once with Rav Hutner, and he said, you know, he, he knows his one very famous yeshiva uh, in Manhattan, that produce, he said, they produce so many Rabbonim, and he says, I'm jealous of them, because I try hard just to make an Ehrlich of Balabas, just to make a pious, normal, uh, you know, lay person who's going to go to work and open a business and follow the Torah, and here, these other, uh, this, uh, this other yeshiva in Manhattan, they produce rabbis, and he's jealous, but in a way, he was also being a little sarcastic, because... In a way, his many of his balabatim were on par with their rabbis, and, and quite often better than the rabbis. Although they produced some great rabbis, but the, the average rabbi that they produced was, you know, on par or maybe subpar to Satmarov's balabatim in certain ways. Um, but when it came to this question of davening and missing Zmantfila and so forth. Samarov said like this, he said, the real Ehrliche Talmidei Chochomim are going to get up and learn before davening. And m- most people, the average Balabatisha person, maybe he has some serves, maybe he will, maybe he won't. You know, and I see myself, I, I struggle with it sometimes to get up and learn. Some days I, I'm able to learn before davening, some days I'm not, you know, things like this. Because I'm just, a, I'm not even an Ehrlich Balabas, I'm a Choyte Machtes Rabbim. I'm like those rabbis that, that he spoke about, even though I, I came from another yeshiva, but... Um, but, but all of my rabbim came from there, most of them. So... Samarov said, the Ehrlich will get up and learn before davening, and the Balabatim will get up and daven. But you give them too much time, um, you're going to, uh, you're going to um, give them time and that they could wind up socializing in ways that may, might lead to improprieties. He understood who he's dealing with, with human beings. And, um, and so therefore, on Shabbos, try, he said, you know, try to keep up as much of their time, and it's interesting because, you know, I remember in Yeshiva, in Yushalayim, I was shocked, you know, I'm used to 
you know, I, I grew up in, uh, when I started keeping Shabbos, you know, I would go to like modern Orthodox school where, um, you know, they would dive in, uh, you know, the one shul that I attended was kind of early, they dive in the 845. You know, which to me was early. Other schools would dive at nine, nine thirty, and um, so, so uh, and that's why it's used. To. And then the Hasidic shul sometimes would be nine thirty, ten, ten thirty, sometimes even eleven. Depends where, what. I think you know the summer was nine thirty, is uh, when, which is not that late, you know, compared to you know you go to Lubavitch, other places. To davening much later, so um, then I went, you know, to Litvish Yeshiva, and they're davening like seven o'clock Shabbos morning, seven thirty, seven forty-five, whatever it is, or eight o'clock, right? You know, and I was like, "What's what's this?" So they explained to me like this, very interesting. They said. They said, uh, they said, you know, in America, you know, forget about the Hasidim, that didn't come in their radar. But the Ashkenaz, modern Orthodox shuls, American shuls, he said, you know, half the people were not, and, and not only that, but, you know, the davening in the yeshiva is not quite as long, and, and it depends which yeshiva you go to, not quite as long as when you go to other yeshivas, when you go to a shul or whatever, you know, usually like a shul davening is much more pomp and circumstance, much more, um, I remember I was with a, 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 a Hasidic Rebbe from, from Yushalayim, I mean, he's from Borough Park originally, but he lives in Yushalayim, and he, um, and we went to South America, I, th- I, don't, I don't remember, I think we were in uh, Bogota, Colombia, he doesn't like to say where, but I don't think he's going there again. So I don't think <laughs> I don't think he's going to be uh, upset that I mentioned Bogota, Colombia. Yet, yet, if it's a place he's going to go again, he doesn't like to mention because ain't a bracha shor al davis But a place he's not going to go again. Not there's anything wrong with it. It's just it wasn't a place where it was very lucrative uh, for fundraising. Because of course that's one of the reasons you know these rabbis travel, fundraising, and so forth. So, he said that, uh, you know, we, we were there Friday night, Kabbalah Shabbos, in the big shul, and the Rebbe said, this was, he used the word, the Ivrit word, and he, it is, I, I want to apologize for using Ivrit, he said it's Tekesi. Tekes in Ivrit means um, a ceremony. And that's not a really Jewish word. You know, it's something that the... The, the um, you know, my our Rav here in White Lake, he always says, you know, whoever invented the word ceremony, you know, his name should be blotted out, because the idea of ceremony takes away from the Hamish kite that we have in our schools, where you feel like you're at home at school. It's like, um, and. Uh, and he said that there was Orthodox shul. He says it was tekesi. In general, he says ceremonial. In general, the classical modern Orthodox shuls were very ceremonial in their style. Today they're less so because there has been this influence, especially you know, boys and girls go away to to Israel, to Yerushalayim, to Israel to study in yeshivas and seminaries, and they come back with the Hamish qualities. Um, you know, people call it, they flipped out, but they, they have that appreciation, and so, but then these things become the new tech I see in certain ways, you know, you have the, like the Karlbach Minyanim, and they, uh, Shlomo Karlbach himself didn't dive in like that every Shabbos, one of my friends, his father was, was by Shlomo Karlbach for a long time, and I, and I, I want to apologize if it bothers anyone that I mentioned him because I know a lot of people had, had problems with him. But, you know, there's this whole movement, and so I don't want to make it trigger, but there's a reason why I'm saying this, and that probably if anyone's 
triggered by that they would probably appreciate what I'm saying, is that they, they turned uh, him to a whole cult thing, you know, and now, so now there's like Karl Bach minion and this and that, and like, and like you have to, you know, people feel like they have to daven like that, or they didn't really daven, and like it's, it's kind of silly, you know, all right, maybe once in a while to have a daven with a little bit extra singing or whatever, uh, I don't know if you want to use his name, you know, it doesn't only have to be his nikunim. There's plenty of nikunim that you can sing, plenty of Jewish tunes that you can sing. But um, probably once in a while, you want something like that because you need a little extra service. But like you see, like Moshe Weinberger in Woodmere doesn't do that every week. He, once in a while, he wants to have a little of service. He does something like this, you know. But uh, the first place I ever ran across it was actually a very Tekasi modern Orthodox shul, which was fascinating to me. Um, you know, I was a young teenager and I was very fascinated by this type of davening because I never saw anything like this. Uh, and I was very, and I got very into it. I was very excited by this approach to davening. But anyway, <coughs> so why did I say tekasi? What, 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 where did I, I don't even remember what I'm talking about now. And I didn't drink that much yesterday. I'm not really hungover. I was saying something about being tekasi, about, about being ceremonial. The... <laughs> the, um... You know, this feeling of, uh, you know, ceremony and this and that. Okay. What was the point of all of that? That's what I was saying. Why do the, the shuls, the modern shuls, make the davening so much longer and so much more ceremonial. <clears throat> and so what I was taught in yeshiva, it's not necessarily true, but it's probably true, was that, you know, half the people coming to shul were not even Shemr Shabbos. So, um, so you uh, make them, you keep them in shul as long as you can, so at least they're there from the instead of, you know, you could finish the whole Shabbos morning davening in an hour and a half. Easy. Even an hour if you go really quick. Um, you know, it depends how long the Torah reading is that week. But, you know, you could get through it sometimes an hour, hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half tops. Not more than an hour and 45 minutes. If you just go straight through it and you don't, and you don't make a big show out of it. Um... But the Balabatish shuls, they made it tekasi. So why? Because the Rabbanim understood that the people might not even be Shemr Shabbos. So at least those three hours that they're in shul. You know, I, I remember I was talking to someone, a conservative shul in Middletown, and, and someone there on the uh, on the board there or something, I was talking to them, and they said, you know, Shabbos morning, it takes them like three, four hours. You know? <coughs> and, and, you know, I understood that the rabbi that they had, he retired, but he was very, um, he was very much, um, I met him once, a very nice guy, and he was really very supportive of the Hamish community, he's very, he has big schus, so, um, he was, he was Shemr Shabbos, he was trying to keep the people in shul as long as they could, because he understood they're driving back home, they're going to go shopping or whatever, or turn on the TV, you know, if they want to watch TV, they should have left on before Shabbos, you know, well, it's probably not really a malacha, but it's still, whatever, <laughs> but, um, it's still a little poor, so, but he understood, he's, but the thing is, is on the other hand, the people are getting annoyed, you know, it's, it's, it's too long, and, they, and they're just going to drop coming to shul, so how do you find the balance in that dichotomy, and it's difficult, that's what life's all about. So, <clears throat> it's finding balance and dichotomy, and that's really the purpose of the video, but I, I want to I, I wanna make it a separate video because it, it's a totally different idea what I'm discussing now. Um, so, they understood they needed to keep the people in shul. So, Satmarav, he was even smarter because the davening isn't terribly long on a regular Shabbos, you know, if it's uh, Arbor Parshios, and, it, and it's interesting because the, the American shuls got rid of Yoytzris, even though it's an old Ashkenaz custom, the Yek is a very big into the Yoytzris, and, and, and by the Hungarian Jews, and also the Galiziana Jews, also Yoytzris is a big thing, as opposed to other Hasidim, the Russian Hasidim, and the, 
and the Polish Hasidim, for the most part, didn't say Yitzris, but the Hungarian, the Galiciana, did, because there was less emphasis on Hasidus also as part of it. Because um, I remember, uh, I was in Yeshiva, and the Yeshiva Queens, where I was at he asked, you know, who, he was talking about Shabbos Agadol, and they'd learn a lot of halachas, the Yitzris of Shabbos Agadol, even though it's not the Psach Halacha, and um, he said, uh, who here says Yitzris? And I was the only one who raised my hand, and he said, oh, all of you are Hasidim, except Yitzchak, when I was like the Hasidish one, you know, more of Bekesh, and the, and the up hat, and, and I think even by then already, Shabbos and Zerik Bieber hit, like, and, uh, you know, because by, um, by it, it's funny because, like, you know, someone, someone said to Arisa Glebovich, actually, to the big Talmud Chochem, and he, 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 someone said, oh, by us, Ashkenazim, we don't say Yotzris. And Rabbi Yitzchak said to, uh, and Rabbi Yitzchak Levitch, very into saying Yotzris. And, and uh, Rabbi Yitzchak said, not a rabbi. He said, uh, but Ashkenazim is more Yotzris, because the real, real Ashkenaz, the, the German custom, is to say all the Yotzris, which even, you know, the Hasidim who say Yotzris don't say all of them, they say, but they say, you know, a lot of them. Not, it's not technically Yotzris, because you Yotzris, they don't say it's the the piyutim in the Shvanesri that they say because it's a, a shaylef, it's a, a hefsik by the, the other Yotzris. Uh, some do, some there's a whole different thing, there's different minhagim. But um, some will say it's mirrors, so whatever, it's not it's not for now to, to discuss, but um, it's interesting if the, if, if this theory that Magachir said in Eretzel was true, they should have probably wanted to say Yotzris also just to keep people a little longer, but then was, I guess people didn't want to say it, so uh, you know, so they relied on the Gra, who really said you should still say it because there's like a Nusach Gra in the Yotzris also. And it's just that uh, uh, the, the Gra said not to say it by Shmuel Ezra, you should say it by Smiris, you know, should say it separate or after Shmuel Ezra or something. He didn't say not to say Yotzris, but it, it developed into not at all. Said Rishar Shavoyda makes a very big deal about saying Yerzus, but that's neither here nor there. And, and, and Yerzus is a beautiful thing, and I get a big schmack from saying it personally. Um, they're very inspiring, and it's Kedai, even if you're in a shul that doesn't say it, the davening, to say it, you know, by the meal, you know, the, something, because, uh, and, and, and maybe have it, you know, if you don't understand, because it's very difficult, even even you understand, Lashon HaKadosh was very poetic, you know, art school has translated a lot of them, you know, so uh, the main ones that are said in most shuls, the art school has in the in their, in the sitter, so, so read them over, it's very beautiful stuff, you know, and it's very inspiring, the Rizal says it, it's all from Ruch HaKadosh, so it's very, it's very, very meaningful and very deep. So anyway, um, I don't think I have time to go to the mikvah today in Ruch Hashem. I don't need to, although, uh, it's not an issue with the video, we'll make a different video anyway. Uh, I have to go straight to work, so, I'm already late as it is. So, I mean, I'll, I'll be on time, it's not a big deal. Anyway, the... So I was saying, so, so Samarov was even smarter. Instead of making the davening longer, he made it a little bit later. And he said, you know, the Balabatim, they'll sleep in a little bit, they'll get up and come to shul. A lot of people are coming to shul late anyway, you know. <coughs> he understood the psychology and also he understood that the children would be in the community and they would grow. Then you know, he understood he was dealing with broken people, they survived the Holocaust. He's lucky that they even still want Yiddishkeit at all, you know. And uh, and so he he had a lot of Rachmanis on his on his Kahila, you know, he didn't push too much and he understood which fights to battle, which which battles to fight and which battles not to fight. And a brilliant, brilliant approach in in all different ways. Um so for him, I should go to Mikva, but uh, alright, no, I'll, I'll go on the way home, I'll figure it out, so, but if not, it's not the fair, it's not the end of the world, I went yesterday, it's all one day for him, <laughs> alright, I'm, I'm thinking out loud, so, Samarov said,
that this is, you know, why he understood to have his Balabatim Davin late because he didn't want to give them too much free time because maybe things could happen that we didn't necessarily want to happen. And it's interesting because, all right, there are many in Nates in Williamsburg also. So and I was counseling someone and they said, you know, they had difficulty with certain Yonim or whatever, and, and they, you know, they encountered different people. And there was one who had difficulties with certain Yonim like this, although they, they found what's the good balance for them. Um, and they, uh, they,
Bible, and so therefore we're not, you know, Sadducees, we're not Karaites, we're not Solo Scriptura people. I know Sadducees and Karaites are two different groups, but, you know, it, it, it says like that in Shulchan Aruch, someone doesn't eat common on Shabbos, someone doesn't eat hot food on Shabbos, it's not, uh, you know, natural domain is, you know, is suspected that maybe it belongs to one of these heretical groups. Um, so uh, I heard, you know, when you eat the cholent, you are really, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, living up to that. You know, you're you're demonstrating your faith, uh, and you're eating your faith. You know, you are what you eat. So you know, that's an interesting approach. So anyway. Um, Then this is the next. So we, I was. Just, I'm talking this about Shabbos and everything, demonstrating the brilliance of what the Samarov said. You know that you have to take up as much time as possible with davening and so forth on Shabbos morning. So people, it's not that the worry that people are going to lose their faith, although that's the subject of my next video. Because it could lead to that as well. Um, and so there, there's tremendous brilliance in this, of, of the approach that Samarov had. And that's why in the Hamesha communities, people would daven late and so forth. And <coughs> a little later, you know, meaning they're not davening at 7 o'clock in the morning, except in Breslov, but they're filled with Amuna. They don't need to, you know, they don't need to daven late. They can, they, they, they can follow the halacha properly. <laughs> because they are, uh, you know, all they talk about all day is, is belief in God, so. Um, but the, um, but the a regular, a regular is, is and, and even for the Ehrlich people, they need to understand they have to give chizik to the Balabatim, So uh, I mean, there are Ehrlich Balabatim. I don't mean, I don't mean like the Balabatim. I'm saying Ehrlich people have to give chizik to the people who maybe need chizik, you know. And so that's also part, of, you know, and it's it's also part of the Kol Yisrael Arayim Zelazeh. And I, I know I made another video about Kol Yisrael Arayim Zelazeh, but but meaning the idea is that we have a communal obligation, and so you know, like how like how the halacha is. That we don't blow a shofar, or take a lulav, or read the Megillah on Shabbos, and the reason for that is that maybe someone's going to carry it on Shabbos, and they're going to break Shabbos. So what? So for that one Jew who might break Shabbos, everyone has to lose out on the mitzvah. Yeah, that's how it is. Uh, so there is that level of kol yisrael or even zelazeh. Now shushan purim. So whatever. So, uh, but again, that's my point: is that the brilliance of this, of davening late and taking much time to daven and so forth, is to keep Jews from really. It's it's you know and, and yeah for for bnei yeshivas it's a different story. But I'm saying for for the average regular balabas, you want to make a big community that's going to be successful and and, and cohesive and do what you want the community to do. This is almost it's a sacrifice that the people have to make. The people who want to be frumer have to make for the regular person who needs some chizik, you know. And it's it's really all about a habas yisrael, you know. It's it's interesting because that's maybe the idea of before we daven. The Rizal says you should say in makabel ad mitzvah they shall be you have to leach uh, that you know before you pray you should say I'm accepting upon myself the mitzvah, the commandment of love thy neighbor. And I, I, I've often mentioned that, you know, when you want to get into someone's a conversation with someone, let's say you have your own your own agenda, you have something in business or whatever, you know, you take them out for lunch and you talk about this, uh, the sports teams or movies or something, and then through that, you know, you find the common, the common, um, the common goals, you know, the common... Uh, uh, common interests, and then you can talk about your 
agenda, you know, whatever the business deal you want to make, and, and that's how you develop a relationship. And so we want to talk to God and ask Him what we need when we pray. You know, maybe people are just saying the words, they're not always thinking about God or thinking about, but yeah, you get to some point and you realize, you know, what you're saying, you know. And, uh, and then, um, you know, you get to this point, and you're, uh, and uh, so the thing is, we want to talk to God. Well, what is God interested? God loves his people. God loves the people of God. And so we say we, we, we also love God's people. What was that, a coyote or a fox? I don't know. Roadkill. You know, deer you see all the time, but the carnivores you don't see so much once in a while. So, the, uh, so we start our prayers by saying, oh, I also love Jews, or I love the people of God, whoever they are. And, um, and so that's a good way to start a conversation with God. You know, we find the common, we find a common interests that we can discuss. And uh, so that's the, uh, that's why we start off dabbling like that. That's my finish on that. I'm sure maybe someone else said it. You know, it's probably not my finish. Um, so anyway, that's true, I'm poor, I might I could be a little... Anyway, that's the idea. What I want to bring out here is the idea of, you know, we're davening late in order to give chizik to the other Jews who uh, were happy at least they're coming to daven. All right, maybe the, the, they're not going to learn after davening. They're going to learn a little bit. Maybe they come to shir in the afternoon, but they're not going to sit and learn for two hours after davening. So, you know, someone who is a Talmud Chochem, who, or who's, you know, you know he's going to get up and either say to heal him or learn or whatever, learn Mishnah, whatever, whatever he is on his level of learning, whatever, and he's going to learn, and, and that's and that's the evolving thing. But, and, you know, and, and, and if not, at least uh, he's coming to davening, you know, but to expect people to learn after davening, they want to eat already, you know, it, it's also, you know, it doesn't make much sense. You know, there's a lot of things. So anyway, you know, and then after they eat, they're tired, and they're gonna, so, uh, you know, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant things with summer upside. So anyway, now I want to get to Shushan Purim. After I spoke for such a ridiculously long time, Shushan Purim, like I read this morning uh, on the Guard Your Eyes email, says Shushan Purim is like Malava Malka, that when we have that void of Kedusha after Shabbos ends, we fill the void with, um, with Malava Malka. And Shushan Purim, in a way, is like that. You know, the rabbis, they still have a tish on Shushan Purim, and, and most Hasidim in America today will wear the shrine of Bekesh, will wear Shabbos clothes on Shushan Purim. And I, I would strongly suggest, if you're not Hasidish, but you should wear your Shabbos clothes if you have a Shabbos hat or whatever. Even you're going to work. I'm going to work today. But I'm going to work with a Strymel and Bekashim white socks. And, and you know, and shame uh, to you know. And so, whatever your Shabbos clothes are, you should wear on Shushan Purim. It's a big thing. And, and, and like I said, Rabbi Sadik in, in uh, Pre Sadik talks about the big Indian of how Shushan Purim is a day of Kabbalah Satira. And that's why we were strimal or whatever. Um, but it's love dive because strimal, whatever your Shabbos clothes are, you should wear a Shushan for him. Now, even, you know, I, I, uh, I, I brought my Shabbos talis with me, you know, I'm, I'm going to have services at work, uh, so I'm going to dive in there. I was, I, it was hard with daylight savings to dive in earlier because of the, the, the clock change, you know. So whatever. I mean, before I, I said, before we change the clocks, I was I was stopping before work most of the time. But whatever, whatever it is, you know. So the um, this Indian of of Shushan Purim is bringing the Kedusha Purim into a day that's bad some for us, not Purim.
I gave my car against the big Chil Hashem and all I thought the Hasidic Shalavosh was supposed to protect you from doing a virus and how can you do this a virus of, of protesting against the Chil Hashem I, I don't understand you know but um, yeah, I've had, but the mice you know there's the Yetzirah there's all kinds of things in the world and this power at least for one day this big day of Shushan Purim I think the Samarav understood that you know you're going to tell people to wear the strimal on, on, on Shushan Purim is going to protect them from doing a virus. And I, I, I feel myself, you know, whatever the Sionis I deal with, I, I, it's like, you know, it's going to be a little bit easier to deal with today because I'm wearing a strimal of Ekesha, you know, even though every day I dress with a Siddish Lavush, you know, but like, you know, the white socks a little bit harder to, <laughs> to hide, you know. Whatever it is, everybody has their nasionis, everybody has their difficulties, and, and it's a tremendous gift of Shushan Purim. You know, I heard that Shushan Purim is so we can become Simchas Purim because we're so busy with the Mitzvah Hayom that, you know, so now, we, whatever, Baruch Hashem, we have, we have Shushan Purim. So, uh, and, you know, and, and I got a lot of chizik. You know, yesterday, I, I on my way, I went to, into the hospital, and Baruch Shalom Fir Tevel, like I, I, um, I was only planning to lay in Megillah once for everybody, and you know, it was a Sunday. It's hard to organize things, so I wound up having to lay in Megillah twice. And um, so, whatever it is, you know, that's uh, that's how it is. So, so I. I Alright, it's been a Shemayim, you know, Wednesday I missed work because I had a flat tire, so I made up the time that I missed, so I, I, whatever, I wound up staying much longer than I originally planned at work, uh, and, you know, I, I was planning I would go home, and, um, and then my wife would take me to where we're having the Suda, which is a half hour away from my house, and this way I could drink, and I didn't, because last year, I came in my own car, but I had to work the whole day, and then on my way home, I, um, you know, I stopped where the Suda, and I met my wife there, and, you know, this year, I couldn't do that, I thought I could, I, I didn't have to do that, so I'd go home and go together with my wife and kids, and then I could drink, or whatever, and, and in the end, I couldn't do it, because I was so late coming back, and, but I, on the, but it was really Minish Mayim how it all worked out because I stopped, as I did last year, I stopped in Monroe to Daven Minka. I saw a friend of mine I hadn't seen in a while, and, uh, and then I went to, uh, I saw a sign that the, the Rebbe was in his house and anyone could come see him. I was like, you know, let me see the Rebbe, uh, Baron Teitelbaum, it's a Sapa Rebbe in Monroe. And uh, let, I just told myself, I was like, let me see, is there a big line there? Uh, you know, because I, I remember like once it was like Erev Yom Kippur and there's this huge line. I was like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go in because I had to be, you know, at, at another hour drive and to get for Fiantiv and everything and have to soda. So I had no time. Before him, let me see. And there was, and there was, uh, there was like no line. I got right in. I mean, you know, a few people, whatever. It was quick, you know, in and out. And uh, just to get a bracha on Purim is nice, you know, from a tzaddik, you know, whatever people say, I, I like him, I think, he's a, I think he's a good rabbi, I really, you know, I like him with Amal Life too, don't, don't get me wrong, I like them both, you know, um, and like my oldest daughter goes to school, so, I, you know, I, I really should have said a car is a type for that because she really enjoys it there, and it's very good for her, um, but, uh, I went into the Rebbe, first I was like, you know, I, I want to, you know, write a kvittal, uh, the Gabba quickly wrote me a kvittal, like, that was the whole thing, he let me go in quick, and, uh, and um, so whatever, I, 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 I put a pigeon with the kvittal, $20, under the kvittal, and then uh, I got the brook on him on my way out, and the Rebbe calls me back, so, and then he gives me $50. And uh, it's funny because I saw it to the little kids he was giving dollars. And I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, I could save that dollar from the Rebbe. And, you know, it's, 
it's a drug. I got the dollar for the rabbit, you know, like like how Lubavitch is at it, you know. But especially on Purim, you know. But I was like, oh, I, it would be nice to get one of those dollars. And instead, he called me. He gave me a fifty-dollar bill, and I don't want to spend the fifty-dollar. And he said, it's for me. It's not like how Lubavitch was giving out for tzedakah. He, he said, this is for you. He told me. But the thing is, it's like. I don't want to spend that fifty dollars because I got it from the Samareba, you know, and it should be a segula. So whatever, I put it in a different envelope in my wallet, and I'm mix uh, a It should be a brook. I should have enough money that I should be blessed to. Um, that I shouldn't need to spend that fifty dollars, and I could hold on to it because I got it from the Samareba. Um, yeah, and hopefully I shouldn't be in any, you know disaster or anything that I need to spend that. Uh, and if I do, all right, the Rebbe gave it to me and I need it, you know, I have to have a Muna, but for right now, I want to hold on to it as long as I can. Um, as a Sekula, you know, and, and the Indian of it is it should give me your Shemaim, I realize, because, you know, if, if I go into my wallet, maybe I'm going to spend money on something I shouldn't, and I'm going to see, you know, here I have this $50 bill from the Sabah Rebbe. How can, how can I spend money on something that's improper when that $50 bill, that picture of Ulysses S. Grant, is staring me in the face? So, um, you know... Interesting how Grant's tomb is so much nicer than, so much bigger than, than Ben Franklin's grave. But Ben Franklin's on the hundred, Grant is on the fifty. I don't know. I've been to both, but I've been to Ben Franklin twice. You know, you could go daven by Grant's tomb. You can daven for fifty dollar bills, and by Franklin you can daven for hundred dollar bills. So, <laughs> so anyway, so so that's this Indian of Shushan Purim really is bringing that Kedusha, and I'm hoping this is going to inspire me, I'm davening to Hashem, it should inspire me, this, that I received this money from the Rebbe, not just that it should be a Segula, that I should have money, which also should be a Pearl de Mirni, but also it should give me your Shemayim, when I'm spending money, and I shouldn't spend it on the wrong things, and I should have a, a Cheshbon of what, why I'm spending, what I'm spending, you know, sometimes, you know, I'd spend money on the things that are a little silly, but you know, and, and whatever I do with that $50 bill, I'm not going to spend it on something ridiculous, you know, I'm going to spend it, you know, if I spend it, you know, either it would be for Chas V'Shalom in this emergency, you know, like I had, you know, on last week, on Wednesday, and you know, I had nothing, and I didn't have any other money, you know, I would still try to hold on to that as much as I could, but whatever, if I had no choice, so whatever. Maybe that's why the Rebbe gave it to me. Or, um, you know, that it could be um, that um, I should have your Shemaim. You know, I'm not going to spend the money, you know, to go to the movies or something. You know, if I go to the movies, I'll, I'll use different money, <laughs> you know. But and also with that stare, gonna be, I'll, I'm going to think before which movie I'm going to go to and why I'm going to the movies. Now, all right, whatever it is. <laughs> but um, but we're gonna hold on to it. You know, it's not gonna be uh, for for an Irish thing. You know, <laughs> certainly not gonna spend that fifty dollars on movies. You know, and it's, I'm not gonna spend it for something else that's not not proper. You know, I'll, I'll, maybe I, maybe I'll buy a safer or something like that. You know, but um, but probably I want to hold on to it. You know. But anyway, that's the, and hopefully I should be benched with the discourse of the year Shemayim that I'm getting from this experience, and hopefully I should be able to, that it should be benched, I should have, it's not just a bracha from the Rebbe Stam, but that I should be able to, um, I should be able to do tshuva and, and be ehrlich, maybe stop going to movies altogether, you know. Although I really want to see Kong Skull Island, but I, I even realized the problems in that movie already, you know. But I, I, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I, I was thinking maybe to go see it tomorrow, but it's supposed to be a storm. Well, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But, but um, you know, probably I'm not going to go to the movies tomorrow either. But whatever it is, you know. But that's the point. So, I, you know, if, if, whatever. I go with my wife and kids, you know, it's a family outing, you know. Whatever. I, you know, 
this, you know, you, you can't, Rabbi Victor Miller always talked against movies and TV and everything, you know, and uh, my Shiva was the, was the president of the shul there, and he, he said he saw, there was someone who came to Rabbi Miller and he said, you know, uh, he's having problems with Shalom Bias and Victor Miller, you know, who was the only English-speaking rabbi who, would, who, who spoke with a strict Haredi, you know, ideology like that, um, so openly and everything, you know, he was, and, and he was a, in a modern shul, he was in young Israel, but he made his Balabatim into a real strong Tamidei Chachamim and Er I mean, he made my Shiva a Balabas, who was a who was, you know, uh, he was a social worker working for the city, and and uh, and he became big Rashiva in Shas, you know, twenty times already, you know, and that's where Rav Victor Miller was was poiled. and Rav Victor Miller, who's the biggest kanoi against movies and TV, told this man who's having problems with Shalom Bias, go take your wife to the movies, because he understood psychology, you know, that there's there's a time and place for everything. I, that's neither here nor there, uh, you know. And, and the same thing. I, I, you know, I have a friend of mine. He's a big, big cousin of Victor Miller. He would, he would go to the every week. He was very close with him. Also, he watches television. Well, again, it's not the end. Of, he's a yid with a strimal. Whatever. It's not the end of the world, you know. Whatever it is, everybody has their own their, their own thing. And I don't want to be Megala's soldier. You know, whatever it is, you know. But that's my point, you know, like. Be normal, boy, but to bring condition that you, if you're going to watch television, you're going to go to the movies. It should, it should be with your Shemayim, and, and at least with the, with the idea, you know, it's a clean movie. It's I'm talking whatever, you know. Uh, it's it's Bittel Tur, it's Bittel Zman, but maybe you can get some physic from it, like like I did from the Star Wars. You know, the last Star Wars, the last time I went to the movies, I can remember was season Star Wars, and and and, and you know, I remember Moshe Weinberger. You know, he said, you know, like. All the movies, you know, you, you could bring out, uh, you know, some Musar Lahas, some Musar Haskell, something, you know. So, you know, he used to he used to show the Twilight Zone in Ezra Academy when he taught English, but he bring Musar out of it and everything, you know. So anyway, um, and that, that should be our approach, you know, and and, and even without Musar, you have Hanor from it. You should take Hashem for the Hanor. I have to thank Hashem for Hanav, a day like Purim, it's a tremendous thing, and a day like Shushan Purim, and it's not just the Hanav, but also the Musa in it, like, you know, that we can, we can bring the Kedusha of Purim into the weekday, and hopefully into the whole year, you know, by that little piercing of, into the mundane world of Purim, it should bring the Kedusha of Purim to the whole year, and that, but also, as psychology, you know, that was what the Samarov understood, uh, telling us to wear the Shrimal and Shushan Purim. So it should be compared to the very happy Shushan Purim. It's the, the Purim Shalmala, the Purim of Yushalayim. And we should be Zoycha to your Shemayim and Erlich Kai. You know, I, I remember in, in Eretzrael, um, Rabbi Stern was the one, uh, Magad Shir there, and he was a, 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 a Dayan. Also, a very much of a yid from England, and he said, you know, he went to Rabbi Sweet Mary Silverberg for him, you know, by the Suda, and he said, you know, he said to the boys, he's like, you, you know, a lot of you, you look down on Hasidim, and you think you're better than the Hasidim. He's a yekker. But he said, he said, uh, what were you doing for him after Purim was over? Here was a, you know, a few hundred Hasidim sitting and listening to Muster. That's how he heard it. He was really, so he may would say it's Chizik, you know, but like, they're sitting there in the dark, crying, listening to Muster. And what were you doing for him, you know, after the spot? And, um, so, whatever it is, so, so we should, we should be zoiche to, to that level, to that, um, to, to that, that's the real message of Purim, is the, that's the real Zagul of Purim, wow, some people are very, uh, I'm going to speed limit, and people are very, uh, very, uh, in a brush, whatever, the Hav and Gedils, so anyway, uh,
so, so we should be able to bring the Koyach of Purim, and there it was already, Shushan Purim, because you know. We should be able to bring the, the, the spirit of Purim to the whole year of Yerushalayim. Uh, and that's what's going to bring the miracles. Tzum Alai, you know, this is the Indian of Purim that we bring into the whole year. Of the, and that's the Simcha of Purim, is that it's, it's our relationship to Kaddish Baruch Hu, even in times when it's dark, even when his face is hidden. You know, I a few weeks ago I went to a, to a meeting at the local community college for, for clergy. And one of the pastor there got up and he said to the dean, he said, it sounds to me like you're inviting God back into the college here. And you know what the dean said? He said he never left. Just because you don't talk about something doesn't mean it's not there, you know? The way I've heard it, it's maybe not the best way. So, you know, everyone has a belly button, but you don't talk about it, you know? God is there, even if you don't talk about it. Even if you don't believe in them, God is there, and um, and that's really going to be the, the message of my next video. But that's really the message of Purim that behind the scenes, God is there all the time. And well, the news that I heard, even though it happened Friday, I got the news yesterday to hear that the Haman, like Preet Bahara, after what he did, to go to go and arrest someone. Because for voter fraud, when it was just the opposite, the people that he was helping were not allowed to vote, even though by New York state law they were supposed to be allowed to vote, and people who were not allowed to vote, who moved away, came back and voted, and that's the real voter fraud that took place in Bloomingburg. <laughs> I saw it with my own eyes. Someone he, in front of the Board of Elections, he said, I got this letter, and they said the letter came from Bill Herman. Is what I heard, even though there was no address in the letter, he was trying to hide. And <laughs> and uh, and he showed the board of elections. Board of elections said, "All right, you can vote, but you should vote uh, absentee. You should vote, you know. But uh, we should look into see if 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 he if his vote was counted with someone Smith or Jones. I don't remember the name. And he said he lives in Middletown, and he and he moved here." He moved away. He used to live in Bloomingburg. He moved to Middletown, and and he was allowed to vote. And all the Hasidim who lived there, like the Werner Rebbe, had been there for for months and months before that. Not only he wasn't allowed to vote, he wasn't allowed to challenge the votes of the people who were who moved away. And so that's how they were allowed to vote. There's a whole conspiracy, and so there was real voter fraud that went on in Bloomingburg from the people who were fighting against the, the development, and they're liars. They're saying, oh, we want to follow the laws. They were breaking the laws, and they're breaking religious land use, and they're like, we're not we're not against the Hasidim, we're just, a, and it's just about following the laws. They were not following the laws. They, they were committing voter fraud and encouraging voter fraud openly, and they didn't get per, 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 prosecuted. And Mr. Lamb, who was only trying to do chesed and, and build up a community and help everybody there, Jew and Gentile alike, and is one of the nicest people you ever want to meet. And because these self-hating Jews are so anti-American and anti-freedom and everything, this is really their goal. Um, and it's really connected to Agenda 21 and things. Um, and this is what's really going on. It's tremendous, tremendous. Wow. So anyway, um, so uh, so now it's we see on Purim. That this Haman, Preet Bahara, he, uh, our great and wonderful president, had the, did a, a Purim miracle for us to get rid of this Haman. And hopefully whoever he appoints new to prosecute the actual voter fraud that took place and not the voter fraud that didn't take place that was prosecuted by this Haman. And Asher Yishlu to Al Yehudim Heim of Esayneihem that they thought, the people opposing the development thought, oh, they're going to frame these people for voter fraud because what? Because they did a chesed of giving some people toothbrushes and want to help them out. You know, because you know, maybe you know, you're trying to unpack. You're moving into 
a new place and, it, and maybe you don't know where your toothbrush is so I'm going to give you a toothbrush you know so you can try to do a favor for someone and because of that they're going to frame them for voter fraud and really and when they were actually committing voter fraud it was just like Heyman with the he made the, ga the same gallows by which he was uh, he set up for Mordechai he should be hanged on these people who framed good people who were trying to build up the community and save the village from being wiped off the map, which was their goal. They wanted to have the village of Bloomingburg wiped off the map, the people opposing. That's how much their hatred was. And take away the, the private property rights of the people in the village to, to, have, to have, you know, um, federalism, that you have the people can make their own decisions, not the people outside of the village can make decisions for them. That's federalism. That's what America was founded on. And they hate federalism so much. They hate America so much. They want the federal government to be all powerful. That's what they had with Obama and that's what they wanted with Bernie Sanders and all these other people and Hillary Clinton. And now we have a president who's letting, who's giving the power back to the people. That was the first thing he said by the, by the inauguration. It's a tremendous thing. So, anyway, it's a poor miracle and uh, hopefully we see that that uh, we were praying that you know Mr. Lamb and Mr. Schwillers and Mr. Nakim and Shibizakai Bedin they should be found innocent because they're totally innocent they're only doing a nice wonderful thing to help the community and uh, there was absolutely no voter fraud on their side but there was tremendous voter fraud on the opposition side and it was all and the Board of Elections conspired together with them, and that's why the head of the Board of Elections um, left. The, you know, uh, you know, she she quit because she got caught with this, and and you know, she didn't want to be wrong, but she basically got caught in a conspiracy to stop the actual people who lived there from voting, and to help people who moved away to vote. So, um, <laughs> tremendous thing, and so hopefully we'll see them in the Hapai Chu, as you usually told Yehudim Heim of name, that all those people who encouraged the actual voter fraud that went on, telling people who moved away to <laughs> back to vote, they should wind up in jail. And this is a poor miracle. This is Mamish with the. Uh, and it's connected to like what I said that uh, a lot of these so called Jews, these self hating Jews, are really Erev Rabbis, they're Amalek, they're real Amalekites, they really relate to Haman. And, um, and it's uh, whatever it is. Anyway, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. And let's hope that the Kedusha of Purim should continue to help us and that we should be airless and follow the laws, follow God's laws, follow man's laws, everything we're supposed to follow. And that's exactly what's done. I mean, I know that Mr. Lamb was careful to, to cross every T and dot every I. Uh, and the same thing with all these other places and all these other things. The other things that that Preet Bahara uh, prosecuted, you know, Sadiqim that he arrested, um, the Shlomi Zakai, but then now we have a new prosecutor and who's going to be appointed by by Trump, who's going to do things according to the law and not with uh, and not with hatred. And we should be zayche to see the miracles of Purim continuing and we should see the building of the base of